We are grateful to be together again tonight for our second meeting on the prophecy of Revelation chapter 13. We're going to continue tonight where we left off last night. And for those of you that were not here with us last night, most of you were, for those of you that were not, we studied about the first beast of Revelation chapter 13. And in Bible prophecy, a beast represents a nation, a political power, and that <clears throat> the Bible identifies that first beast of Revelation chapter 13 as the papacy, the Roman Catholic system. And tonight we're going to not focus so much on that system, though that topic will come up again as we see the second beast of Revelation chapter 13. We're also going to talk about the new world order in light of Bible prophecy. All right, the United, Nation, the United States, the United Nations, and the New World Order is our topic tonight. And just to help us understand what we're studying tonight, I've taken some Bible verses, and this is lying at the foundation of, to, of the study this evening. Paul writes in Corinthians, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine upon them. So here again we see the great controversy. We have the God of this world, which is Satan, the devil. He is working against the gospel of Christ. He is against Jesus Christ. So it's a controversy between Satan and and Jesus Christ. And the Bible calls Satan the God of this world. John records Jesus' words, Hereafter I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me. The Bible also calls Satan the prince of this world. Jesus himself uh, met the prince of this world in, in, the, in the wilderness. Again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them and saith unto him, all these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. So the basis for our study tonight is to see that God in heaven allows the devil playing room upon this earth, so much so that the Bible calls him the God of this world or the prince of this world. And he has a lot of kingdoms. He is the one controlling much of the affairs of this world. Of course, God limits his power in what he does. But just remember that Satan is active in this world in the various nations. Not only in religious powers, as we saw yesterday, but he's also involved in political powers, very much so. The United States was founded, we said yesterday, to provide a safe haven from papal persecution. The United States was founded as a land that developed the full biblical principle of religious freedom, religious liberty. The first country in the world that has fully recognized religious liberty. And so here we have the pilgrims that came over from Great Britain, from Europe, to the shores of North America. And eventually, this country was established and became a great nation. Well, the times have changed, my friends. I've been reading a little bit in the news uh, in the past, and it seems very strange that a country dedicated to liberty, and in, in some cases now banning the American flag. Isn't that very strange? I don't know all of the details, but I know it's in some schools or institutes, universities, in certain occasions, the people are not allowed to fly freely the American flag. I could maybe understand that if it was in China, right? But in the United States, it, it seems very strange. So this country is changing from what it was 200 years ago. One of the statesmen that helped to establish this nation was Benjamin Franklin, and he was a very, very intelligent man. He says, 
those who would give up essential liberty to purchase a little temporary safety deserve neither liberty nor safety. And some of the excuses for banning the flag in the United States are to provide safety. If you fly the flag, you're going to cause aggression or hatred, and it's safer not to show the flag. Those who give up liberty for safety deserve neither, said Benjamin Franklin. Very wise words. And um, especially, I would say, since 2001, 11 September, liberty has been disappearing more quickly in the name of safety. So the Bible in Revelation chapter 13 talks about another beast. Now, this beast is different than the first beast we studied about last night. And John writes in verse 11, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. So you see some characteristics that are given in this beast. So John sees in vision another nation arising, another political power. Let's look at some of the characteristics of this second beast. Can you see the white print up there? I hope so. All right, we're going to identify this second beast. The beast, as we mentioned, symbolizes a political power. We find that in Daniel chapter 7, verses 17 and, verses, and verse 23. All right, this second beast rises after the first beast. So chronologically, this beast comes later. We saw last night that the first beast arose in the early centuries of the Christian era and that the, the second beast had a deadly wound inflicted when Franz Napoleon took the Pope Pius as prisoner and the papacy lost its temporal, its political dominion in 1798. It retained its uh, ecclesiastical power, but it lost its political power. And so this second beast is rising up out of the earth around that time, around the year 1798. This beast, the Bible tells us, it rises up out of the earth. Now, what is the earth? Well, we know from Bible prophecy, Revelation chapter 17, verse 15, that, that the seas, the waters, represent, uh, or the waters represent uh, multitudes of people. And that first beast, it rose up out of the sea, out of the multitudes of people. It came in a heavy populated area. This second beast, it comes up out of the earth. So it comes up out of a sparsely or less populated area. That's another characteristics, out of the earth. The Bible tells us that this beast had two horns. And if you study Bible prophecy, you know that horns represent power. They're a symbol for power. So this beast had two separate powers, two sources of power. And I got ahead of myself a little bit there and wrote Republicanism and Protestantism, but I'll talk about that in a minute. All right. The Bible tells us that this beast is like a lamb. Some of you probably have lamb, uh, sheep at your, your homes or have raised them. A lamb is quite a harmless beast, isn't it? It can't really do you harm. A lamb is seen as innocent. And actually in the Bible, the lamb is a symbol of Jesus Christ. So the lamb-like beast symbolizes a Christ-like political power or a, a, a political power that represents Christianity or associates somewhat with Christianity, a helpless uh, political power or nation. And a lamb is a vegetarian. A lamb does not devour other beasts. The first beast, it was a carnivore. 
it was devouring other beasts. It was a, the other beasts of Daniel are carnivores, but this beast is seen as a vegetarian. That is to say, it doesn't come into existence by conquering another nation or another political power. Interesting characteristic is the last one we have here on the screen is that this political power speaks as a dragon. Now there are at least two things implied in this uh, point. And the first is that the nature of this beast changes because when it comes up, it's as a lamb. As far as uh, uh, east is from west is a lamb from a dragon, they're not at all similar. The dragon is a characteristic totally opposite of, of uh, a lamb. The lamb represents more Christ and the dragon represents more Satan. All right, so the nature of this political power is going to change. And it also implies or can mean that this nation conceals its true identity under the guise of a lamb. So while it's trying to pretend it's innocent as a lamb, Really, at heart, it's a dragon. It's, a, it's a, speaking as a dragon. All right. So this is, these are some characteristics of that second beast. And there are really only, there's really only one nation in the world that it can represent, and that is the United States. We could establish that more fully, but that's not... Uh, our point this evening. The, the prophecies are clear on that. The two powers that the United States had, one was republicanism. The government was founded as a republic, and in a republic, the law decides how the nation is operated. It's not a democracy where the majority decide what happened. A republic follows a set of laws, and the republic's a foundational law is called a, a constitution. And so the United States established a constitution, and that's the law which this republic was founded upon to follow. And note, uh, according to the U.S. Constitution, there are many statements here, but no title of nobility shall be granted by the United States, and no person holding any office of profit or trust under them shall without the consent of the Congress accept of any present emolument, office or title of any kind whatever from any king, prince or foreign state. So the United States was established with no king and it could not be allowed to have a king. The people that came here realized that kings had destroyed Europe and they didn't want to do the European system. They wanted a government without a king. And so one of the great horns of the lamb-like beast was republicanism, a government based upon a law, the constitution. These two horns also symbolize the separation of church and state. The, the republicanism represents the state and the other horn of power was Protestantism. Again, this nation was founded to escape from popery. And the Protestant values made this country a great nation. And so there was a separation of church and state. Jesus was a very wise man, a, a great teacher. The Leaders at his time were always trying to trap Jesus in different ways, and he was always a step ahead of them. One day they brought a coin to him, and you could take out a coin. I got a, a coin here today from someone. It's a 10-cent piece. It has whose inscription on it. <laughs> Remember that? Who is on the 10 cent? Pardon? Frank and Roosevelt? I thought it was someone else. Is that true? Isn't it Eisenhower? All right. Whoever it is, it's a president. Can we agree on that? It's a president, right? 
Roosevelt was a president, Eisenhower was a president. Anyway, and so when they brought the coin to Jesus, he asked them, whose inscription or whose image does it have on it? The question was if, if they should pay taxes to the Romans or not. And so if Jesus said yes, they, he was trapped. If he said no, he was trapped. So he came with a, a question to them and asked whose image it was on that coin. And they said unto him, Caesar's. So we have Caesar there, Augustus Caesar, who was the, the Caesar when uh, Jesus was living. And then Jesus said, Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. So Jesus said, God has some things that belong to him, and Caesar has some things that belong to him. Don't mix the two together. Keep the state there, the government there, keep the religion Keep the Christianity there. So Jesus here prophesied of the establishment of the United States, a nation that would have separation of religion and separation of state. And that is a ground pillar in the United States, the two horns, the state representing one and Protestantism the other one. A country without a king and a country without a pope. The Bible continues on in Revelation chapter 13, verse 12, about this political power. It says that he exercises all the power of the first beast before him. Now, who was that first beast before him? That was the papacy, right? That's the papacy. So now we see that the United States is going to use all the power of the papacy and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. Now there's a characteristic here that this must be some type of world power. If a political power, if a nation is going to, going to cause the earth to worship, then this nation, this power must have dominion all over the earth or political military strength. So again, this is a characteristic that fits well United States. Verse 13, and he doeth great wonders so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. So the identity of the second beast, it would become a worldwide power. It would enforce religious legislation. It would cause all the inhabitants of the earth to worship. It would follow the image of the papacy, which was a union of political power and religious power, a union of church and state. It would become a type of Protestantism that was apostate. And then there would be a fire coming down from heaven. And this is a reference to the book of Acts, the day of Pentecost. It's a, the Holy Spirit coming down upon the apostles. But here, there is a difference. This fire is a false fire because it's used to deceive. It's, a, it's used to compel people. And so this is not a true fire from heaven. It's a false fire from heaven representing power from Satan and Satan's miracles to do false wonder, uh, fal false miracles, false spiritual manifestations, a false Christianity. Now we're going to go into some history and, and some other pictures here. <clears throat> Remember, Satan is the god of this world. He has room to to act, to, to, to rule upon this earth in certain spheres. And God gives him that permission. And, and from the beginning, from the founding of the United States, he wanted to destroy the United States because he hates religious freedom. He hates the separation of church and state. And one of the institutes that he is using is called Freemasonry. 
and you see there at the top of the picture there between the two angels there or the figures that should describe angels there and all what we call the all seeing eye you see that up there that's the first president of the united states named george washington many of the presidents of the united states have been uh, uh, up into the 33rd degree of Freemasonry. You see different presidents there, Monroe, Jackson, Roosevelt, and so forth. This is a secret organization, and you don't really know what is happening there unless you've personally been involved and get out with your life. It's not revealed what is really happening in these secret organizations. Some other Freemasons that have lived in this world, there are many. Karl Marx is one you've maybe heard of before, and also Napoleon, and Joseph Stalin. These are some of the different uh, Freemasons. This is uh, the Grand Lodge in Philadelphia, the Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania. I don't know, you perhaps cannot see so well, but on those pillars, there are two pillars in the middle, middle there, there are Egyptian pictures. Actually, on all those, all those uh, pillars and on the wall, on the sides there, you see three pyramids. You see the sun or the light going out from the pyramids. You see uh, the sun in the pictures. You see uh, Egyptian symbology and so forth. So Freemasonry ties part of its beliefs into ancient Egyptian sun worship, a mixture of truth with error. We know a man in Denmark that's a Freemason and uh, we've just recently met him the last few months and we were trying to determine if he really knows what, what's happening there or not. And I don't think he really knows. But he gave us, uh, we were asking him some questions just to kind of see what he was thinking and believing. And he gave us a, a pamphlet here, the Danish order of Freemasonry. And uh, interestingly enough, in, in Denmark, it's its own Freemason system. Sweden has its own and Denmark has its own. But anyway, um, in, in Denmark, you have to be, you have to be baptized in the church, that's the Lutheran church or the state church. You have to be baptized in the Lutheran Danish church to be a member in, in Freemasonry. So it comes under the guise of Christianity. And I just want you to see that cross there in the middle, you see it? It's a symbol, I think it's called also uh, the cross of Malta maybe, something like that. And you see that symbol there, the red cross in the middle. And, uh, <laughs> You will find in these here organizations and movements, symbols are very important. And it's really careful when you buy your clothes or your vehicles or, or toys or things that you look at the symbols. <laughs> you might have to take some of those symbols off <laughs> or cover them up because uh, Symbols speak thousands of words, though they don't say anything. And uh, here we are at the Vatican, and you see the, the symbols on the priests there, or the friars, monks, however they're titled. There you see that, and you also see on the flag the, the same cross that we see in Freemasonry. And then uh, you see it also on the, the Pope Benedict, the, the same cross on his dress there. And it's... It's actually like four arrows pointing together. It could be saying something like all roads lead to Rome, for example, or out of all the world, we're going to unite in the middle. That could be part of what this symbol is saying. I do not know. But it's interesting to know who wears that symbol and where it is found. Here you see it on a famous German man that's dead now on his military jacket you see it on his breast there on his chest 
You see it there again, the, the same cross. And here's one of the other generals. You can see it up on his, uh, by his uh, collar there on his shirt and also on the pocket there, you see that same cross. Here you see it again on the, the collar there, that same cross. And the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So there is a collaboration of various religious organizations, political organizations that are under the operation of the God of this world. And one of his principles is working in stealth, in secrecy. And he's not going to come out clearly and tell people what he's doing. And neither are these institutions going to come out and tell you exactly what they're up to. But we need to be studying the life of Jesus to know how to live. And it's good to have our eyes open and, and to know how to see what's happening in these spheres or circles. This is uh, from uh, Assyria around the time of Saul, King Saul, or, or Samuel, the period of judges around that time, a king of Assyria. And you see also that cross there in the middle of his chest. And uh, so it's a pagan symbol or a symbol that goes back to Babylon, to Assyria. When our, our friend there, there, or the man we know in Denmark, the Freemason there, had a special event, he made this little shield to God alone, glory. And uh, you have the cross there. And then on the right upper hand there, we have a, a sun. And the sun has seven rays. Of course, he said that symbolizes the seven, the seven days of creation or the, the creation. It's an interesting symbol that we see in many different places. One of the places we see these seven rays from the sun is on the head of the Statue of Liberty. Here we have them. You can count them. And uh, the Statue of Liberty was a gift to the United States from France. You learned that in school. But you probably didn't learn all the other things behind it. It came out around the time of the French Revolution. And uh, so it's tied together with the sun, the sun worship, and also exalting the goddess of reason. And actually, when the revolution occurred in France, they threw away the Bibles and... Welcome. <laughs> Good to see you. We're glad you could come. And uh, are you going to be able to see if you sit there? Can you see the pictures all right? I'll try not to go in front of them. Are you all here? Are the others coming? Or All right. All right, thank you, good. <clears throat> well, I just want to review a little bit of what we're, we're studying tonight. We, we've started and uh, we're talking about um, Revelation chapter 13, where we left off last night. And we're looking at a different power and that power is the United States. And our title is the United States, the United Nations and the New World Order. So we're going through some different uh, symbols and um, organizations, religious bodies, and we're just looking at those symbols and what they perhaps mean for us today. So I hope you can follow along with us now. Anyway, when uh, France had the French Revolution around this time, 1790s, the people were fed up with the papacy and they wanted to get, uh, get away with the corrupt religion. And so they threw out the Bible also. And in the stead of the Bible, they uh, edified or lifted up a profligate woman, a harlot, and exalted her as the goddess of reason. So they threw away Jesus Christ and said, now we're going to worship the goddess of reason. And this statue symbolizes somewhat this event. And so you have the rays of the, the sun there representing uh, sun worship. 
and you have the, the torch of light, illumination to the world. And uh, going back a little bit to some Samaria, to ancient uh, uh, society around the area of Babylon, the sun god is called Shumesh or Shamesh. And you see the, the light coming from the sun uh, as a benevolent god. So it's uh, sun worship goes back to Babylonian times. Here we have the Egyptian god called Ra and uh, also associated with the worship of the sun here. And you also see the serpent there. Not a good symbol when it pertains to worship. Here we have another example of artifacts that have been dug up or found from the east, from the Middle East. You see the sun there, the worship of the sun. Mithra is the, the old Persian god. You see the, the rays of the sun uh, around the head going out. Here's another example of this god or a similar one uh, clothed with the sun, the, the light going out. The Greeks, uh, so you're seeing this, uh, this pattern of worship continued from generation to generation, from nation to nation. Babylon, Medo-Persia, now it comes down into Greece. Helios is the word for sun in Greek. Uh, the sun, the, uh, the, the planet or the star in heaven, the sun. Helios is the, the, the Greek word for sun. Here he is in the fourth century before Christ. You see, it's the sun god. And uh, here's another, another one in, uh, I think in France, in a museum. You see also the seven horns, as you see on the Statue of Liberty, representing the, the, the light from the sunshine. Here's another one, it's a little bit better, the seven horns. And from Greece, then we transfer over to Rome, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome. And we have also the seven horns on the solar god, Apollo, the Roman god. Welcome. We are speaking about Revelation chapter 13 tonight, the second beast, the United States. And we're going a little bit into the Freemasons and some symbols that we find in different religious organizations and political movements. So welcome. And um, so here we have this sun worship continuing through these pagan cultures. And here's another rendition of Apollo with the seven suns, seven horns that you see on the Statue of Liberty. So it's not by coincidence that the Statue of Liberty has seven horns or seven rays of light shining out. There's deep symbology in that. And uh, it's important that you're aware of these things. Here again, we see the, the horns on the, the statue there or the, the rays of the sun shining out. And um, again, on the right side there. And as we study the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation, we see that after these pagan kingdoms, the papacy continues in their footsteps. So we have Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, pagan Rome, and now we go over to the papacy. The popes took over for the Caesars. And then we see these symbols coming in to the Catholic Church. Here is a picture supposedly of Jesus, I would imagine. And you see the sun around his head as you did in these pagan deities. Here also you see the sunshine going out. And uh, here also you see a pagan symbol, the sun, and you see also a Christian symbol or supposed Christian symbol, the cross. The cross is also really a pagan symbol. But anyway, you see the sun worship coming in to the Catholic system. Now, something very interesting is this here. It's called the solar wheel, a circle. 
And uh, it's divided into eight uh, sections, four on the top and four on the bottom. And in Sweden, I was, the television was on this morning and they were showing the, the Native Americans dancing. And I looked and they had a, a pole somewhere in the middle that they were dancing around in Sweden, actually on 21 June or the weekend that is closest to 21 June, we have midsummer. And the people, they put up a cross with the two bars and then they put circles under the bars of the cross. It's a symbol of fertility, the woman. And then they dance around the, the cross. This is a Swedish called Midsummer. It's a custom still that people do, a tradition in Sweden. And actually that is uh, the summer sol solstice <clears throat> in Sweden. And in, in here, it's the, the day of the year when the, there's the most sunshine. It's the lightest day of the year, midsummer. And the opposite of that is Yule. You heard that time before. In uh, Sweden, actually, for Christmas, we say Yule. We spell it differently, but it's called Yule. That's actually the winter solstice, the day, the time of the year when the days are the shortest, where it's the most dark. And so the Catholic Church said, well, let's put the birth of Jesus there at Yule, the birth of the sun god, the birth of Jesus. And so that's why we got December 25th as the birthday of Jesus. And uh, we have on the right side there in spring, the vernal equinox, Ishtar or Easter. That's uh, the time of the year when the light and the darkness are balanced. That's when they decided to make Easter the church. And on the, up on the top left there, we have Samhain. That is Halloween or All Saints, All Saints Day. So you see our, our um, holidays that we have in the church are based upon sun worship. And it's interesting to study that a little bit. This is just a, a small taste. Something else that came out of uh, the French Revolution is uh, these here qualities. And uh, we'll practice our German a little bit. All, all, all Satian or, or, or all Satian. That's a region of France, I believe, uh, the north east of France, perhaps, the part that's maybe closer to Germany. Freiheit, Gleichheit, Brüderlichkeit, Uder Tod. That was the cry of the French Revolution. Liberty, equality, fraternity, or death. Tod den Tyrannen, death to tyrants, Heil den Heil den Volken, health or long live the peoples. And you see that on this symbol around the time of the French Revolution. 1792, it says on the bottom there, this picture. And uh, our current government has been very socialistic uh, the last eight years. And uh, it's not by accident that that has happened. It's, it's planned. Socialism is something else that came out of the French Revolution. Here we have Svoboda, Bravenstvo, Bratstvo, uh, the same as we just saw in the French Revolution. Now, this is socialism or communism, the hammer and the sickle. Freedom, equality, brotherhood. My brother lives in Portland, and I hope he's not sending his daughter to this club here, but in Portland, the, the schools have decided to have a, a, a club after school for Satan. Well, there's religious freedom, so you have it now. It's probably going to teach about the same things they're learning during the day in school also, but anyway, that's another topic. Anyway, um, the man here that's the group's leader says the program focuses on science, and rational thinking, and it will promote benevolence and empathy for everybody. So that is brotherhood, we could say, uh, and equality. Benevolence and empathy for everybody. You can also say that's brotherhood and equality. Once religion invades schools, as the Good News Clubs have, the Satanic Temple will fight to ensure that plurality and true religious liberty are respected. 
So here we have also the Satanists ensuring liberty for us. So they also stand for liberty. Can you see it all right there? Yeah? If you need to, you can move over. Right? It's easier for you to move than for me. So. All right. Another instrument, the people that are making decisions for us is the media. Hollywood, for example, this is the torch of light disseminating uh, truth, truth <laughs> through the media, through television, through media, uh, through the movies. And we saw earlier the pyramids in Egypt and you know you know this very well the the dollar has the pyramid on the back and you're going to see more clearly this evening why it's actually on the back side of the dollar bill there the pyramid interestingly enough the the bill uh, the picture is not complete the the the, the triangle is not put on the top yet and it's almost like it's almost ready to be put in place, but it's not quite yet. And so this is an Egyptian symbol. We see the what's called the all-seeing eye. The light is going out in all directions. And some people say, well, that's the eye of Jehovah, the eye of God. Well, God says that we cannot <laughs> make images of him. So we probably couldn't make an image of his eye either, could we? So while some Christians use this symbol, it's actually going back at least till Egypt, right? This all-seeing eye, it's a, a symbol that's used in the world today. And uh, actually you see on the bottom, under the, sim, um, uh, under the uh, pyramid, Norvus, uh, excuse me, no, uh, Novus Ordo Seclorum. And that is simply a new order of the ages or a new order of the worlds or a new world order in Latin. And the top there, it's also Latin. It says annuit co coiptus. I don't know if I got that one right in pronunciation. Annuit coiptus. It means it approves our undertakings. It, it uh, yeah, approves our doings or our undertakings. And uh, some would say that the Jehovah God with the eye approves what's happening or the providential leading, uh, providential leading. But there can be other meanings also to that. So why is this symbol on the dollar bill? And here we have, again, the Catholic system, the Catholic Church, the all-seeing eye there. Pro uh, trying to say that it represents the the eye of God, but it's a symbol coming back from Egypt. Here we see also in Aachen, a, a city in Germany, the cathedral there on the wall there, we have the all-seeing eye and the light going out from the pyramid. And by the way, you know, when the pyramids were made in Egypt, at certain times of the year, you see the light, it makes, it casts the shadows in certain ways. So when they laid out the pyramids, they did it according to these solar times. They knew when the sun was at its highest point. They knew when the sun was at its lowest point. And they laid these things out according to the, the sun. And also in Peru, I think it's called Machu Picchu, you find the same there, tremendous uh, architecture done there. Uh, that's in more recent times. But these things are tied together with the worship of the sun. And now you see these symbols. This this poor soul, she was growing up in Australia and her parents were pastors and uh, she wanted to become a singer and it didn't work for her in the church somehow to become a popular singer. And she made a covenant with Satan, actually. And now she has millions and millions of people worshiping her, but she has sold her soul to the devil. And... So you see these symbols are coming now into music. This is the all-seeing eye from Egypt. You have another one that has sold her soul, certainly also to the dark side, Beyonce, making the same symbol, the pyramid, the all-seeing eye. And you see the lady on the left, we just showed you her, and another one also with this all-seeing eye. And so you also, we also need to be careful to what kind of music we're listening to. 
you know, what powers behind that, that music we're listening to. I, as a lad, I used to listen to uh, heavy metal music and I um, really praise the Lord that uh, he led me out of that. And now when I look back to what that music says, I, I, I'm wondering how come I ever listened to it. And I, I praise God that I, I got out of it. And so anyway, we need to be careful with uh, what kind of music we're listening to. These are fallen stars. They're not the true stars. They're fallen stars. They are demons in flesh or people that are possessed of demons. The one there says she has Sasha that lives inside of her, and he takes over sometimes when she gets on stage. And Sasha is a demon that is possessing her. So we want to be careful. And just, you know, it's amazing that you're, you're finding these symbols together in the church and in the world. It, it can't be that way. Something's wrong, right? And so now our second part was the first part, the United States, the United Nations. And we're going to go into the United Nations now. And um, symbols are very important. And uh, another lesson from history you probably didn't know, but I'll tell you tonight. The reason for World War II was so that the United Nations could be established. It cost maybe 30 million lives, but it got the project done. The reason for World War II was so that the United Nations could be established. And it was established exactly after the Second World War in 1945. And where was it established? The same place where the Statue of Liberty is. And it's not by accident that it was established there. So the United Nations was established in New York in 1945. And <clears throat> symbols are important. There are 33 parts of this circle divided into eight parts. There are 32, four times eight is 32. And then you have the middle part, 33. It's a very important number in Freemasonry. And you have a solar wheel. Can you see the solar wheel? And uh, the United Nations is based in pagan sun worship also. You're gonna see that more closely in the next hour. Another place we see the solar wheel is in Rome probably the biggest city in Italy, and particularly in Rome in the Vatican, you have St. Peter's Square. You see the solar wheel there? Uh, the circle is a, a symbol for female um, fertility, and you have in the middle there the obelisk, which is a symbol for male fertility. So you have the, the pagan fertility rites here, you have the solar wheel in the Vatican, the center of the worship of modern day worship of the sun. And if you put them side by side, you can see it more closely. You see the solar wheel there in these two symbols. Robert, Robert Mueller, Mueller is, uh, he, yeah, I think he's dead now, but he was a, a part of the United Nations. And, uh, I think he was from that area. Anyway, a boy from France or Alsatia, 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 I don't know how to pronounce that, visited him and asked him, why doesn't the UN abolish all borders as we did in Europe? And then he says, out of the mouth of children comes the truth. So this man wants to abolish all national borders, take away all national sovereignty. More recent names of countries such as the United States and the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics are not natural poetic names. The political objective shows in them what sad poor names they are compared with the names of virtues of, or nature. Furthermore, they want to unite what is below, not what is above. Why not a united world or world union instead of states or republics? So you see this man, and he's not alone. There are others in the United Nations that uh, have this philosophy. They want to annihilate all national borders. That is the purpose of the United Nations. And it's contrary to the Bible. The Apostle Paul was in Athens, I believe, and he, he told the people there an important truth that God had made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth. 
and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitations, excuse me, the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord if haply they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. God has made national boundaries or bounds for the habitations of the peoples. He wants different nations. God does not appreciate prejudice. There's a limit to nationalism, but he created boundaries for reasons, right? And now this United Nations, they want to take away all the sovereignty of the nations and just make one big, huge government. How is that going to work? <laughs> a lot of centralization, it's not going to work so well because we are different. We have different uh, religions. We have different cultures. We have different customs. And it's better that we do that there and others do that there, right? <laughs> so it's an anti-biblical movement and philosophy. All right, this tells a little bit about Robert here. Robert, he was an international civil servant with the United Nations, assistant secretary general for 40 years. And his ideas about world government, world peace, and spirituality led to the increased representation of religions in the UN, especially of New Age movement. Isn't that amazing? Now, where did I get this? I got this right off. Yeah, right on the top there. It's, it's right out of Wikipedia. <laughs> you know, I was reading his, his uh, quotes, and they were, they were very um, interesting, what he was writing, and it, it sounded good. And then I looked at Wikipedia, and, and I understood, because he mentions God a lot, but he's talking about a different God. So. Through his influence at the United Nations, his ideas about peace and spirituality have led to an increase in the United Nations in the New Age movement. And we're going to look a little bit more at that uh, here. In 1992, Marie Strong was a Secretary General of the Historic United Nations Earth Summit in Rio. In order to ensure the success of the summit, Strong's wife, Hannah, held a vigil with the Wisdom Keepers, a group of global transform, transform, uh, transformationalists, through round-the-clock sacred fire, drumbeat, and meditation, the group held the energy pattern for the duration of the gathering. So this is new age to the highest degree at one of the summits. and. A quote from this man, the real goal of the Earth Charter is that it will, in fact, become like the Ten Commandments. This is a statement from Maurice Strong. So documents are being created to take the place of the Word of God. The former prime minister or president, leader of the Soviet Union, or was it Russia or both? Do not do unto the environment of others what you do not want to, what you do not want done to your own environment. My hope is that this charter will be a kind of Ten Commandments, the Sermon on the Mount, that provides a guide for human behavior toward the environment in the next century. So the new Ten Commandments are is something that they call the Earth Charter. And you can go on the internet or somewhere and, and read about that Earth Charter if you so desire. All right. A new um, agenda that the United Nations has come out recently with is called the 2030 Agenda. That's in about 13 years or 14 years. Time goes quickly. We'll see if they get to that agenda or not, if the Lord permits them. So the United Nations is trying to establish a, a, a uh, world with peace. They don't believe in God, so they have to establish peace, a kingdom that will last on this earth for at least a thousand years. And they're doing it their best uh, according to their own wisdom. Now, this document is also very interesting. It's called the 2030 2030 agenda. It's called sustainable development. And that's really a buzzword in the last years is sustainability, right? You have it in uh, agriculture, you have it in food market and, and environment and so forth. 
sustainability. <clears throat> well, you have to know how to read these type of documents to really understand them. And if you read them without understanding the Bible or Bible prophecy, you will think they sound good because they, they couch it, they clothe it in very uh, majestic terms. But understanding some of these points we've been talking about tonight, you see there's ulterior motives here. All right. This is the importance of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, point 19, as well as other international instruments relating to human rights and international law. We emphasize the responsibility, the responsibilities of all states in conformity with the Charter of the United Nations. That is to say, basically all the countries in the world are in the United Nations. There probably are a few that are not, but basically the nations are not going to be allowed to escape from these charters, from these rules. It's going to be compelled upon all nations. That's what this point is saying. Another point here is realizing that gender equality and the empowerment of women and girls will make a crucial contribution to progress across all the goals and targets. Now, this is talking about equality. Where did you see equality before? That was in Satanism. It was in the French Revolution. It's in socialism. So here you see equality. And what this is really saying is transgender, homosexual, whatever, it's good. There is no family. There's no traditional role of the man, no traditional role of the woman. Everyone is equal. Everyone is on the same plane. There is no family. That's what this point is saying. So... It's destroying the, the fundamentalist view of the Bible, of the, the home, the, the husband and the wife. Point 24, we are committed to ending poverty in all its forms and dimensions. This is another type of equality, socialism. You give your money to that person. Everyone distributes the money equally, but yet there's still the elite that have some money, but all the others will be on the same level. So the rich nations will bail out the poor nations. So this is declaring a economic equality for all except the elite, right? They will be able to keep their wealth somehow. Now, this is really interesting. We commit to providing inclusive and equitable uh, we commit to providing inclusive and equitable quality education at all levels, early childhood, primary, secondary, tertiary, technical, and vocational training. That sounds good. And you know who wrote uh, the Common Core curriculum that uh, was trying to be implemented in this country? It was actually the, the fellow we looked at earlier, Robert Mueller. He was the driving force behind this Common Core curriculum. So this education that all are going to be granted is socialist propaganda or socialistic values. Uh, take away national so sovereignty, a new interpretation of history. The earth is, is uh, God and, and yeah, all these strange types of education. So it's not really a good statement if you think about it. We recognize the positive contribution of migrants for inclusive growth and sustainable development. So what's been happening in Europe the last five years, it's not an accident. It's planned. We're going to take down the borders. The Pope said if, if we don't build up walls, we take down walls. If you want to build a wall between Mexico and the U.S., you're not good. And, and, and so... The migrants are being put all over everywhere. The borders are being taken down. So the, the religions are getting mixed up, the nations, the cultures. And uh, this is part of the globalist agenda to amalgamate all the religions and all the governments. 39, the scale and ambition of the new agenda requires a revitalized global partnership to ensure its implementation. So there will be a revival of globalism. There's going to be a press to everyone work together to get this thing implemented in all the countries. So they're going to make their strength together, put their strength together to try to get this thing passed. 
All right. And so it's not an accident that Pope Francis was at the United Nations a year and a half ago addressing the United Nations. It's one of his institutes of uh, world dominion, or at least they're working together. They have the same goals or similar goals. And when you look at it, really, globalism is the same as socialism is the same as Satanism. This is a picture of the Tower of Babel, one world confederacy that will eventually go against the God of heaven. This is interesting. This is an organ or an official piece from the European Union. You see the pagan fallen stars or the, the pagan symbols of the stars there. And you see similar to the Tower of Babel, Europe, many tongues, one voice. And here you see the EU Parliament in Strasbourg, Strasbourg, I believe. Some people liken it to the European Union, uh, to the, the Tower of Babylon, the Tower of Babel. Another interesting symbol we have in Bible prophecy in Revelation chapter 17 is a woman sitting upon a beast. And I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast. Revelation 17, 3, and here you have in one of the EU buildings there, you have a woman riding upon a beast there. The beast is a little bit different, but the principle is the same. Here you have a two, two euro coin. You see a unclean woman riding upon a bull. The Prophecy of Revelation chapter 13 continues. We identified earlier that this second beast was referring to the United States. And the Bible tells us, continuing in Revelation chapter 13, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast. Excuse me. Saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. This is a big statement here, but in brief and short, the second beast, which the second political power, the United States is going to have false miracles, false, false spiritual power, and it's gonna do those things with the papacy's acknowledgement, and it's going to say to the people, the inhabitants of the earth, that they should make a likeness or an image of the papacy, which had the sword, had the wound by the sword and did live. So the image of the beast is something that's going to be like the papacy. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. So these two powers are going to be working together at the end of time. And if you don't go along with that agenda, there will be power that will try to, to kill you or legislation that will try to, to eliminate you or put you away. And um, this is when Francis was at the, the Congress there a few months ago, several months ago. And the United States is going to make an image of the papacy, the Bible says. <laughs> Sometimes wonder about these hand gestures and hand symbols. But you see an image, <laughs> very interesting, I found. <laughs> so the United States is going to make an image to the papacy, a likeness of the papacy. Well, the papacy was known for its using the kings or the nations to enforce its dogmas. The papacy was a union of church and state. Remember, United States started as a lamb with two horns, the state here the church there, it's going to speak as a dragon. The dragon is the power behind the papacy and the dragon is gathering up steam to come behind the United States and is going to unite church and state. And uh, the United States is an image of the beast or image of the papacy. You see here, we looked at the solar wheel earlier there with the obelisk, the obelisk and the dome there, the Vatican. You see that same symbol in Washington, D.C. 
a perfect image of what you have in St. Peter's Square. You have the Washington Monument, the obelisk, which goes back to Egyptian sun worship. It's in the Vatican. And then you have the dome on the opposite end there. Exact image of what you have in the Vatican. Very, very interesting. Not done by accident. Uh, was it last year or was it the year before? The Supreme Court ruled that homosexuality must be favored through legal marriages. It's legal now for two men or two women to marry one another. And that day or that night or shortly thereafter, these colors were spread out on the White House. That's amazing. That was also planned for that to be done. So this has happened within the last year or two, the acceptance of homosexuality. And when a nation does that, it's saying a lot. The Bible forbids this. The Bible says, thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is abomination. Now, Rev, uh, Leviticus chapter 18, it talks a lot about, a, 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 lot, a lot about different sexual sins. It talks about uh, committing adultery and, and doing strange things outside of marriage. So the Bible doesn't improve the Bible doesn't approve adultery, but with homosexuality, the Bible says it, it is an abomination specifically about that sin. And there were two cities in the time of Abraham that were destroyed, actually five cities that were destroyed because of that, because of that sin of homosexuality. And the Bible says, the Bible warns us, it's a warning to the United States. It's a warning to the government of this land. And the land, it's uh, Leviticus 18, verse 25, and the land is defiled. Therefore, I do visit the iniquity thereof upon it. And the land itself, and the land itself vomiteth out her inhabitants. Verse 27, it says, the abominations that the people of the land are doing, it's causing the land to be defiled. And the land will, the land that the land spew not you out also when you defile it as it spewed out the nations that were before you. So this is bringing on the judgment of God to the nations. The nations of Europe have also done this. Most of them or many of them and other westernized countries. And it's bringing the wrath of God upon these countries. So when we talk about homosexuality, it's really destroying the right half of the Ten Commandments. Talking about marriage, honor thy father and thy mother, and also thou shalt not commit adultery. So this is breaking the Ten Commandments. We've been talking a lot today about the sun and the worship of the sun. And the fourth commandment on the left side, it says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And so the right side of the commandments is now being destroyed. And soon the left side is going to be destroyed also. The sun day, we have a word in English called sun day. Sun day is the day of the sun or the worship of the sun. And straight from the horse's mouth, prove to me from the Bible alone that I am bound to keep Sunday holy. There is no such law in the Bible. It is the law of the Roman Catholic Church alone. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And so forth. Remember we showed in the pictures how the sun worship came from Sumeria, Assyria, Media, Persia, Greece, Rome, into the Catholic Church, the worship of the sun. And the symbol of that sun worship is the Sunday. Sunday is a Catholic institution. And its claim to observance can be defended only by Catholic, only upon Catholic principles. There's no evidence from that in the scripture. This is from the Catholic press in Australia. So these uh, secret societies, these organizations, these governments, these religious movements are trampling upon the law of God. And remember we said last night, that is the foundation of 
our lives. It's the foundation of the truth. It's the foundation. And Jesus says, how be it, in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, ye hold the tradition of men as the washing of pots and cups and many other such like things ye do. And he said unto me, full well ye reject the commandment of God that ye may keep your own tradition. So the nations, the governments, these organizations are joining forces together for the last great battle, the battle of the great day of God Almighty. John sees in vision in Revelation chapter 16, three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. They are spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. So you see here these spirits of the devils, they're going out to the kings of the earth. Spiritual power united with political power. And we have the dragon that represents Satan. And we've seen how the United Nations has accepted the new age teachings. It is accepting the new age. They want to create a new age, a new world. And I liken that unto spiritualism. You know, back in the book of Genesis, when Satan was speaking to Eve, he told her two lies. And these two lies have become the foundation of spiritualism. The first one was that you will not die. That is, the soul lives on forever. That is a ground teaching in New Age religion. You have the karma in Hinduism and uh, these other teachings where you go on to the next phase, the next level after you die. That's spiritualism. That is teaching you will never die. The other lie is that you will be like God if you eat that fruit. That is the other lie that Satan told Eve. Another pillar principle of spiritualism of the New Age movement. God is in you. You just need to get God out or, or use yoga and meditation to get God working in you, right? To get in harmony with God. So spiritualism, Satan's lies, New Age movement, spiritualism, the dragon coming out now in the United Nations and, and other Christian circles. The beast we looked at last night is Catholicism. And the false prophet, it's another name for the United States apostate Protestantism. So these three spiritual forces are going to come together and they're going to unite with the kings of the earth. And the Bible warns us that Babylon is going to fall. Babylon is the papacy and the fallen daughters of the Roman Catholic Church, the fallen Protestant churches. That is the Babylon of the Bible. And the Bible tells us that it's going to fall. And if you're still in false worship, the Bible gives a message to us. It says, and I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues. So the Bible gives us the warning not to receive the mark of the beast. And the Bible gives us the warning to come out of Babylon. It's a message of love to get out. Come out of her, my people. So God has people that are in false systems. And some are waking up and it's so exciting to see people in different parts of the world that are realizing that they need to get out of this corrupt religion. And it says to come out. Where are they to come into? They are to come into Jesus Christ and to his true body. To come in to Jesus Christ. And we are looking at a, a look at another prophecy here as we close tonight. And uh, we have a, a song that I want you to, to think about as my wife plays it. You can come. And... Uh, there's a movement in this world to unite the governments. And these governments are going to give their power over to the church. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings which ye have received, which have received no kingdom as yet, but received power as kings one hour with the beast. 
These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. So these kings or these political powers, it might be the United Nations or something similar, is going to give its power over to do what the Roman Catholic Church wants it to do. I remember last night the quote was from Perez that there's really no other suitable man than the Pope of Rome to lead the United Nations, at least the United Nations of religion. Jesus is knocking at the door tonight. He's not only knocking at the door of the United Nations, but he's knocking at your heart's door. Won't you let Jesus in to your heart tonight? Maybe he's already there, but we can always invite him to stay and to help us. Jesus gives us a promise that he wants to eat with us. And he is promising us a place to sit with him in his kingdom as he is with his father in the kingdom. And listen to the, the song that we're singing. Amen. You know, this can be kind of a discouraging message to, to find out what's happening in the world and what's happening in, in the governments. You know, this world is not our home. And it's a good place to live. It's a good country still. But God has something better for us. And I believe he's allowing these things also to transpire to take away our attachment for this earth and to realize that our home is in heaven. And this is the city we want to live in, to be members of the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven as, as was sung as a bride adorned for her, for her uh, husband. The new Jerusalem, Paul says, Eye has not seen, ear has not heard what God has prepared for them that love him. So let us be encouraged to give our best to Jesus Christ and to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Yeah. Not yet. Just wait. Let me, let me finish. 
Jesus gave us the promise. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Wouldn't you love to have a place in that city? I do. <laughs> and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. So Jesus is promising that he will come again. And he's not going to live here on this earth. He's going to come again. Look at this. I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Where is Jesus? Jesus is living in the new Jerusalem. So he is going to come again and take up those from this earth to meet him in the skies of heaven and take him home with him for eternity. That is the new Jerusalem, and that's the home for the blessed. And I encourage you tonight to spend time with Jesus, spend time with God in prayer, in Bible study, to make this your home. And, you know, we're living in serious times. And I just pray that, that, that we can realize that and, and study as we have never before to make our lives and callings 